All right. Shall we begin? Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming today. Um, my name is Lila Rose Kaplan, and I am the very first KITP playwright in residence. Um, today we're going to be talking about how to hold on to your audience at a conference or a cocktail party. Being in theater, I think about this a lot, how to hold on to an audience, and it seemed like something that could be useful to share with you guys. Um, I put our agenda up for the day. Introductions, we're talking about audiences. We talk about classical story structure, some storytelling strategies, and then there'll be room for questions at the end. Um, let us begin with introductions. So first I'll introduce myself. So I'm originally from New York. When I was in high school, I would turn my physics notes into poems and submit them to the poetry magazine and get them published. So I have long been interested in this conversation. <laughs> I thought activation energy was like the coolest phrase I'd ever heard. <laughs> um, and thought a lot about kinetic and potential relationships in my life. So this has been like an ongoing thing. So um, after high school, I went to Brown University where I studied playwriting among other things. I lived in New York for a couple of years after that. And I wrote and directed a number of plays. I went to UCSD down in San Diego where I did my MFA in playwriting. A year after that, I had a play produced off-Broadway, which was very exciting. It was a play called Wildflower that recently got published. So now I'm a published playwright. Um, I recently won the National Science and Playwriting Award from the Kennedy Center. This is an award that Alan Lightman gives out once every two years. My play was called Biography of a Constellation. It was about astronomy, obviously. <laughs> um, and we may do a reading of it or excerpts of it later this year. So stay tuned for that. Um, so I'm here at Kavli to research more plays that I might want to write inspired by science. To put you at ease, I am nothing like a journalist. I'm not going to quote you or take something you said out of context and publish it tomorrow. I'm much more interested in collecting interesting people and ideas that I can then transform into something for the stage. So it's likely that anything you tell me will never verbatim appear anywhere, except maybe in my notes. Um, David told me it'd be very good to let you guys know that I'm less scary than a journalist. <laughs> um, so today is the first of two talks about storytelling and science. I have a number of tools from theater that I think will be useful to you, as I said. We're going to focus on story structure and storytelling strategies. And my next lecture is going to be about physical storytelling. And that has more to do with the story you tell with your body and your voice when you're speaking. We'll hit on that a little bit today. But that'll be the next one. So if that interests you, you should definitely come to that. I'm hoping to bring in a wonderful woman who's a professor in the theater department to help me with that, because she's actually a trained actor. And they know more about that than I do. Um, Sorry. Yeah. Are you being recorded? I, I have oh, a. Good, good. Because for those who have to miss some of these. Yes. Who are you planning to bring in? I Annie Torgliziani. She's a new faculty member, and she's fantastic. Um, but before I dive in, I'd love to get to know a little bit more about all of you. So what I'd love to do is quickly go around the room, and if everybody can say their name, what you research, and a favorite movie or play. And I will go first. I'm Lila Rose Kaplan. I write plays about the mysteries of human relationships, and I also write plays inspired by science. And a favorite movie of mine is The Kids Are All Right, which I just saw. <laughs> yeah. uh, my name is uh, Jared Burns. I'm actually a postdoc at uh, NCES, the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis. Uh, and I study the consequences of global environmental change for ecological networks. Um, and a favorite movie or play, I'll go with The Kids Are All Right. <laughs> 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 Nicely done. <laughs> yes. My name is Jean-Pierre Hébert. Uh, I make drawings with sound, as you know. And uh, my favorite play is uh, Caligula by Albert Camus. Ooh, nice. Uh, I'm Bill Phillips. I uh, am an experimentalist uh, studying cold atoms. Uh, it seems like I spend half my life giving talks, many of them public lectures. Uh, <laughs> and my favorite movie of all time is It's a Wonderful Life. Very nice. I'm Marty Einhorn, the deputy director. Um, my research is currently mostly in relation between elementary particles and cosmology. Um, <coughs> hard to say. I was. I guess my favorite movie is Casablanca. <coughs> I'm 
Sarah Vaughn. Um, I started out life as a writer. Uh, I then had a second career as a material science and scientist in archaeology in the Aegean. And then I've come back to fundraising and writing on the side, so I'm trying to get the most of both worlds. My, one of my favorite films would be um, Dinner Rush, which is a wonderful mob film, but it actually takes place in the context of a story about an Italian restaurant and a meal served there by night. Hi, I'm Ari Turner, and I'm just visiting here. I study like magnetism and superfluids. And uh, a favorite, wait, I forgot. Favorite movie or yeah. play? No, I mean, I forgot which one was. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help you with that. Um, it's Pygmalion, I like a lot. Excellent. Okay, my name's uh, Lincoln Carr. I do research in quantum many body theory. Uh, favorite plays, like 10 plays by Shakespeare. <laughs> Othello comes to mind. Great. Um, I'm Frank Krishnan, and I'm visiting here for the semester, grad student at the University of Illinois. Um, I work on glasses, I guess. Um, my favorite movie is Annie Hall. <clears throat> Hi, my name is John Biddle. Uh, I'm also here for a semester. I'm a graduate student at University of Maryland. Um, I study quantum mini body systems. Um, I can't say I have a, like, a favorite movie, but one that comes to mind is uh, Pan's Lab. Well. I'm Sandy Fetter, and I'm, I'm from Stanford here for four weeks. I um, work on cold gases, and I guess, let's see, a favorite play would be uh, Shaw's Man and Superman. Um, my name is Christian Randolph. I'm a postdoc at the University of Virginia. I'm visiting for this year. Um, my research is about integral systems and conformity theory. And one of my favorite movies would be um, uh, Kings, and, Kings and Queens um, of Arnold de Is that a movie? That's a movie. Excellent. Yeah. Hey, uh, my name is Stefan. I'm a postdoc here in high energy physics and string theory. Um, so my favorite movie, uh, just maybe it's a French movie by Mathieu Kassovitz. It's called La Haine. It's, it's hate. It's a, it's a really <laughs> disturbing movie, and, <laughs> but uh, it, it's about basically about violence in, Fran in French suburbs. Well, now we clearly we all need. But it's a, it's a it's a very good movie because uh, when I when I watched it um, after after sorry La Haine. because uh, when the when the movie finished after that scene I just I was just stuck in front of the screen and I stayed like like this before. Without moving forward. They, for they held on to you in the audience. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. It is pretty old. But. Great. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Sophie, and I'm a postdoc in the physics department on string theory. Um, I don't really have a favorite movie. I, I like uh, generally movies by uh, Emilie Kusturica. Uh, is there a movie you like a lot? Uh, like I don't, Black Cat, White Cat. My name is Brian Clark. I'm a postdoc at Princeton. I do numerical simulations of strongly correlated systems. And uh, my favorite play is Our Town. Um, my name is Kevin Chargi. I'm the visiting science journalist here, um, covering the neuroscience program. And I, let's see, I'm a big sci-fi fan, so I think Star Wars is kind of a classic movie. Original Can't go wrong with Star Wars. <laughs> My name is Lothar Follett. Um, I live now again in Switzerland, in Zurich. I'm visiting for four weeks. I also work on cold gases and numerics. Uh, there's no such thing as my favorite movie. There are only like movies that made a great impression. Mm -hmm. And one of them is definitely La Vita e Bella mm -hmm. from Roberto Benigni. Beautiful movie. Uh, I'm Tony Z. I'm a uh, professor of physics here and a failed writer. <laughs> and I don't have, a, I can't think of a favorite movie or play, but uh, I could mention a play that uh, made absolutely no sense to me, uh, which was that a few years ago at the ITP we had that theater fest, and one of the playwrights had a uh, play produced by the student theater here on campus, and we mm -hmm. all went, and the play was based on interpretation of quantum mechanics. And it, and it didn't go well. <laughs> All right, well, thank you. I'm 
uh, Steve Avery. I'm also a graduate fellow here for the quarter from uh, Ohio State University. And I study uh, black holes in the street theory. And uh, maybe Rosen Cramps and Gildenstern. Awesome. My name is Hans Jokers. Um, I'm, uh, I'm also studying string theory, and my favorite play would be 12 Angry Men. I'm Rob Fremke. I'm a neuroscientist from NYU. I study how experience changes the brain. And my favorite play is No Exit. I'm Gede Minasidoranas. I'm visiting for four weeks. I'm working on things like uh, called atomic gases or slow light. And one of my favorite movies is uh, Yellow Brick Road, because it was shot 60 years ago, so it still looks quite modern. <laughs> nice. My name is Aaron and Buff. I'm, uh, I'm visiting here for three weeks from the Weizmann Institute in Israel. Uh, I, st I study called atoms. And uh, one of my favorite movies that I've seen recently is uh, Inglorious Bastards. I'm Joe Polchiski. I'm a permanent member here. I work on string theory and all the things it's connected with. Um, and I guess I'll go with Pulp Fiction. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all for indulging me. You've all done the scariest thing, which is speak and say something out loud. And also now we all know each other a little bit better, um, which leads me into our first topic, which is audiences. So what we're really going to be talking about today is audiences and attention, right? What makes an audience pay attention? What makes them stop? What's boring? What's interesting? And a little secret I want to share with you is that every single person in this room is actually already an expert in what's interesting. You know when you want to change the channel watching TV, and you know when you kill someone if they change the channel when you're watching something. So you're too, we're already tuned into what makes us pay attention and what makes us not. The trick is how to convert that instinct into actual tools to give a talk. So today I'm going to share some tools with you for communicating in a dynamic and engaging way when you're at a conference or a cocktail party or anything in between. In theater, we talk about the idea of having two contracts. You have a contract with the material you're presenting, and you have a contract with your audience. What does that mean? It means that with your material, you are going to take care of what you're presenting. If you're an actor, that means you stay in character, you do your staging, you say all your lines as written, which is a particular pet peeve for playwrights, <laughs> as you might imagine. Um, taking care of your audience means including them in what you're doing. You speak so they can hear you. You pause if they laugh so they don't miss the next moment. You give them whatever background information, whether it be in the program or in the lobby, that they need to understand the play so they'll have the best, best chance of understanding what you're putting <laughs> on in front of them. OK, so what does this mean for you guys? Well, I think you guys also have these two contracts. I think you have a contract to your work. You want to get up here, and you want to represent your theories or your findings or your ideas accurately. But I think you also have a contract to your audience that you need to take care of their experience of listening to you. So today, we're going to talk about some ways you can do that. Something I did today was put this agenda up on the board. Because I know when I go to something, I like to know that my time is going to be taken care of and not wasted. And I like to know how it's going to work. This is like, you know, from like first grade when we'd have on the board like snack time, math time, whatever. And not that you should do this in your talk, but this is one thing I do when I talk to let people know, hey, you get lost, this is where, you know, you can come back to this key. And it's my way of saying, and I'm here to take care of you. I'm not just going to ramble. I have a plan. So some things you can do that we're going to talk about today are you can tell your audience a story with a structure that they recognize so they're comfortable along the way. You can give them somebody to cheer for. You can make them really curious about a mystery and then supply them with a satisfying answer to whatever questions you've raised. And perhaps most importantly, you can use words they know. So let's start with story structure. So the way that I'm saying you're all experts and what's interesting, you're actually all also experts in story, because we're all surrounded by story all the time. You got read stories when you were a little kid. You see stories in the media all the time. We all kind of experience the story of our lives as a story. So I'm going to share some, basic, some basics of classical story structure that will help make your talks accessible and engaging. To do this, I'm going to take apart The Wizard of Oz, which is a story most people know. I hope most people here are familiar with it. And then once I kind of identify some basic story tools that Wizard of Oz uses, Wizards of, Wizard of Oz uses, ha, <laughs> the tongue twister I wasn't expecting, um, I'll show you how you can apply those same tools to your talks. Um, here are some terms we're going to use today. 
Once I define these terms, I'll show you how they apply to Wizard of Oz. But just so we all know what all the words mean, use words your audience knows. In, in storytelling, the protagonist is the person whose objective drives the story. What's an objective? An objective is what a character wants. So in Wizard of Oz, we're going to say Dorothy is our protagonist. And her objective is that Dorothy wants to go home. So you can say the whole movie of Wizard of Oz is Dorothy trying to go home. An obstacle is what gets in the way of a character achieving his or her objective. Stakes are what a character has to lose. And the major dramatic question, and this is important, is the question that drives the story forward. And usually, and this isn't always true in kind of experimental things, but for our purposes today, the major dramatic question is the same thing as the protagonist's objective. So the major dramatic question of Wizard of Oz has to do with Dorothy getting home. All right, anyone have any questions on these terms before we move forward? Yeah. So I would have thought that stakes also has to do with what a character has to gain. What's the, uh, what's, what's the, the, the thing about emphasizing losing? <laughs> it's a good question you ask. Um, I think we're more attuned if somebody can lose something. Like a movie about someone winning the lottery is less interesting to me than a movie about someone winning the lottery who then loses all the money. There's something I think we, we fall forward with. You know, you watch somebody lose something. You know, if a movie about two people falling in love is interesting until they actually fall in love, and once they have each other, the movie actually tends to get pretty boring. <laughs> Unless suddenly there's a third person and there's a you know love triangle. So I think what somebody has to lose is usually a way to keep people interested. That's a good question, though. Any other questions? Great. So stick with me. We're going to Wizard of Oz for a couple moments here, and then I'll show you how it can connect to what you do. So we're going to find my chalk. And then this is the diagram that a lot of people in theater use to talk about what we call dramatic action, which is basically the mechanism of telling a story. Um, you may have seen this diagram. You may not have. It's useful, I think, to think about storytelling. This first thing here, this first chunk of our journey, is what we call exposition in theater. So this is where we learn some background on our hero. So in Wizard of Oz, we learn Dorothy lives in Kansas. We learn that she's bored. We learn that she wants an, an adventure. We also learn a few other things, but those are sort of the big things we learn. Then there's what's called the inciting incident. This is a very important moment in any story, and as we'll talk about later, in any talk or conversation. This is the moment that really kicks off the story. So in Wizard of Oz, there's a cyclone. That's the inciting incident. There's a cyclone that whooshes in and pulls Dorothy away, far away from her home. What happens after the inciting incident is that the main character's objective is usually established. So what's, you know, Dorothy's objective is Dorothy wants to go home because of cyclone. And that also establishes our major dramatic question, which is, will Dorothy find her way home? So because a big crisis, something happens, dislocates character, character wants to get back to stasis, is usually how these stories work. Then there's what's called rising action, which is coming along here. And rising action is where we watch a main character like Dorothy face increasing obstacles as she tries to achieve her objective. So Dorothy tries to go home for a big chunk of the movie, and all these things get in her way, right? They're like. I don't know, there are poppies that make her fall asleep. There's like flying monkeys. There's like the wizard that isn't real. There's like a witch trying to kill her, right? There are all of these things that are making it very, very hard for Dorothy to go home. An important thing about the shape of this is that they get harder as it goes. So if Dorothy met her hardest obstacle here and then everything got easy, it wouldn't be as good a story. Um, so she goes, she goes, she goes, and then bang, we get to what's called the climax. And this is where, yes, the major dramatic question is answered. Dorothy will find her way home. The hero has succeeded at her quest. So this is where, I don't remember, Dorothy gets the shoes. She can click her heels. She can go home. As an audience member, you're like, ah, OK. Will Dorothy find her way home? No, 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 yes. And then the very last little bit, and I probably made this too big because it doesn't actually go very long in stories usually, is what we call falling action. And this is like the conclusion or the, rev the revolution, the conclusion or the resolution. And in Wizard of Oz, a big part of the following action is that Dorothy realizes there's no place like home. That's kind of her takeaway message. So we start with a girl here in exposition who's bored and who wants to leave. And by the end, the change she goes through is that actually 
she wants to stay home with Auntie M and everybody else. Okay, so what do we have here? And what I just told you, we have a hero or a protagonist who wants something, so she has an objective. We have high stakes that make us care about her. She can't go home. If it was like she walked down the block and could just walk back, Wizard of Oz would not work as well as it does. But she's been completely you know, dislocated. Um, we have interesting obstacles in her path that get more interesting as the story goes. We have a satisfying climax where she achieves her objective. And we have a resolution where she learns something as a result of her journey. So that's like pretty classical storytelling. If you hit all of these marks, your audience isn't going to change the channel. They're going to be on board with you. The story creates something that I like to call dramatic tension. And it's because Dorothy can't get home and the stakes keep getting higher that you keep watching. And then finally, when it seems completely impossible, she does get it. And that's kind of like a pretty classical structure for mysteries or any kind of adventure story or this. And the other thing I wanted to say about this is that the fact that Dorothy cares so much about getting home makes us care about her getting home. If Dorothy didn't care about getting home, Dorothy was like, I like Oz. I might get an apartment here. <laughs> like, the end wouldn't matter as much as it does. OK, so how does this apply to you? Well, these are really universal principles of storytelling. That's another way of saying these are universal, universal principles of holding on to your audience, which I know is something that matters to all of you, or you wouldn't be here. So I think we can translate these same principles to when you give talks or to when you explain what you do at a cocktail party or anything in between. Let's go back to our initial term. So the protagonist is going to be you, because you're our storyteller. The objective is what you want to solve. Um, I know it isn't always possible to boil what you guys do down to a simple question, <laughs> but looking at, just for the purposes of right now, looking at one of the talks this morning, we could say, like, how do the orbital phases of cold atoms work? Like, that could be a question, an objective. Obstacles. This loosely translates to the journey you're, you take with your research when you talk to us. What happens on your quest you know, to achieve your objective? What are your flying monkeys? What do you encounter along the way? And stakes are very important whenever you talk to anybody about anything. Stakes need to be both about you, the protagonist, the storyteller, and also your audience. Why does your objective matter to you? And why does it matter to them? You know, We pay attention to things either because we care about them or because somebody else that's talking to us really cares about them. And then getting back to this idea of the major dramatic question, which is the same as your objective. It's the idea that whatever your question is has to drive your story forward. Everything you say has to go back to that question. Every scene of Wizard of Oz, once Dorothy goes to Oz, is about her getting home. There are no extra little cool scenes of things. Everything, every scene you can boil down to. She's trying to get home. It doesn't work. She's trying to get home again. still doesn't work. All right. So let's look at our trusty diagram. Did I miss a page? No. Um, how could this work with what you guys do? And I know that um, what I'm about to say will not fit every talk you give or every opportunity you have to talk about what you give, talk about what you do. But I think it's really useful to think about it in these pieces and use it when it's useful. So instead of exposition, we could talk about um, background. You know, at the beginning of any talk or any explanation of what you do, it is useful to give who you're talking to enough background to understand what you're about to tell them. Inciting incident. What is your cyclone? What is your question? What's going to drive this talk or this conversation? You know, will Dorothy find her way home? How do orbital phases of cold atoms work? You know, in, in my place, sometimes the question can be like, you know, will this mother find this missing child? You know, whatever the question is, that then it's going to take us through the story. Um, rising action. So here we are. So like Dorothy, you try to answer your objective. You show us the steps you took along the way. What were your methods? What were your poppies that made you fall asleep? What was your you know, wicked witch? What happened on your journey? And something that I think is worth noting is that in storytelling, you want to build an intensity as you go up this steep cliff here. And I know that, I, think, I feel like this is in some ways the trickiest one to translate to what you guys do, because I know that it isn't always, you don't always get to go from like the munchkins to the witch in terms of time. But I felt like it was really important to convey this to you guys, because as a storyteller and an audience member, it's important to build intensity. So if your story happens to naturally fit that, that's great. If it doesn't, there are things you can do with how you tell the story or how long each chunk of the story is. It's generally better to get shorter as you go forward, which I know isn't always our inclination. 
Um, it's like in a mystery, in a murder mystery, the best clue is usually last. You have the best clue first in a murder mystery, you know the end, and then this, you know. So I think it's about kind of thinking about how to keep the mystery alive and how to kind of uh, keep, the in, the, keep the intensity building. I'll hit more on that a little bit later. But back to our diagrams. So then we get to the client. Yeah. Most science seminars to a mm -hmm. scientific audience uh, start by stating their conclusions. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> and if they don't, a lot of the audience already knows. Sure. So, so the notion of uh, a suspense, building suspense, mm -hmm. doesn't really translate. In fact, if the speaker doesn't tell you where, where he or she will wind up, you kind of, sometimes you interrupt and say, well, where are you going with this? <laughs> so so uh, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's quite different from a mystery. Here we know, too. We know that she, she would make it home. Yeah, <laughs> in most stories, you know. <laughs> going to succeed usually. Sure. Not always. Obviously there are tragedies. But we you all know the conclusions to all the Shakespeare plays, but we go to them anyway and we're excited. Well, it's something about, and you ask a good question, but it's something about the way you take them then through the journey to get back to that conclusion. And I have some ideas later in this that I'd love to share and see if they resonate. But let me get through the rest of this and we can come back to it. Yeah. But in fact, I, I think I'd like to, to take issue with you. In yeah. fact, I do like to build dramatic tension, both in my talks and, and some of my colleagues don't like this, in my papers. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that I don't like to give it all away at the beginning. <laughs> well, that's a good way to keep an audience. It may not be the way that science standard works as a standard way, but if you tell everybody everything at the outset, they're less likely to listen. <laughs> I also think that the conclusion is not necessarily Tension is not necessarily a conclusion, but how you get to the conclusion. Well, the tension builds. Well, something I was going to say about if we get to the top of rising action, you get to your climax, <laughs> you have a result, you have a revelation, you have something you want to share. That has to be the highest energy. And this might go back to what you're saying. Even if that's the thing you tell them first, then you take them on a journey to get back to that. Um, Anthony and I were talking earlier. You've got to, if you have a, a takeaway message, what are you walking away with this from? And it, usually the message is living up here somewhere. And then falling action is your conclusion. What's the new idea you want them to walk away with? What's your version of there's no place like home? Let me just get through the rest of this and I'll answer your question. Sure. So the things I want to just connect to over here, if we're going to you know, connect in some way your background, your question, your methods, your results, your conclusion. Stakes are really important. As I said before, and I say this a lot today, if Dorothy didn't care about getting home, we wouldn't care about her getting home. So we need to know why you care and why we should care about what you're saying. Objective is really important. You need a really clear objective when you're talking. We've all heard talks, scientific or otherwise, where people don't really have something focusing what they're saying, and you zone out really fast if you don't feel taken care of, if you don't feel like the person driving has a good map, or their iPhone's you know, thing is working and not going to buzz out. Um, and then with conclusions, I mean, it's just really important that you hit whatever you want us to leave with. Because just like I'm going to talk about later, the first couple minutes of any discussion is really important. The last couple minutes are too. Because at the beginning, you grab them. At the end, you remind them what you want them to leave with. So you want to take care of your audience till the moment they leave the auditorium. That means during your questions, during your conclusion, people talk to you on your way out. Everything you do leaves a lasting impression about what you said. All right. What was your question? Oh, yeah, it's really just a comment. Maybe giving conclusions in the beginning mm -hmm. is another narrative trick. It's kind of like flashback. Sure, yeah. I mean, what's funny about presenting this to you guys is this isn't how I was trained as a storyteller. I went to Brown as an undergrad where the rule was you had to break all the rules. So this is very traditional. And a lot of the plays we were taught to write at Brown like start somewhere over here and then make a weird shape and kind of end at the beginning. I mean, so like you can play with this in theater, and I'm sure you can play with it in this form too. But I think understanding how this works for an audience is really important. Understanding that this is what we're looking for. And if you're going to play with the pieces, that's fine. But they all have to be there and still taken care of. Um, OK, so that's kind of just big chunk idea about story structure. Do we have any other questions about this or comments? Yeah. One thing that I'm not getting is the inciting incident. Mm -hmm. That sounded. Well, it was it's it was a little bit vague as to how to um, work that into mm -hmm. the scientific talk.
talk. So could you say a few more words sure. about how that might work? Well, an inciting incident and your objective and the major dramatic question are all connected, right? So the inciting incident in, a sto in this story is what establishes that Dorothy wants to go home and will she find her way home becomes the quest we're on. So obviously you guys all do very different kinds of science and think differently than I do. But my hunch as an audience member is there's a way to frame what you're saying. I don't know whether it's presenting it, how it connects to the larger world people might be in. You need to pay attention to this because it's going to affect your future. Going to, you know, um, what were you going to say? Yeah. Um, uh, the thought about this is, like, for instance, very often, you know, the theorists give talks that are based on some experiment that, you know, um, had a, that, that showed some phenomena that no one really understood, and that kind mm -hmm. of inciting incident, like, you know, how do we understand mm -hmm. uh, this data, for instance? Sure, great, Sarah. Yeah, I'm going to say the same thing. New, yeah. new data uh, mm -hmm. is a primary example, or something. That's so this discovery has happened, yeah. or this. Yeah. Because I guess the cyclone is really new information for Dorothy, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I guess an equi like an information equivalent to a cyclone is what you want. That's a great question. Other questions? Yeah. I think there's also you know the the apparently unsolvable theory you know that's presented and it's mm -hmm. shocking and then and then you suggest that you might have an answer and that everyone wants to know. <laughs> <laughs> so that could also be very common in theory talks. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So that's another one. That's a big, like, stop, we're going to change the world. There's going to be a cyclone. Lila? Yeah. Uh, I actually uh, would disagree <coughs> with most of the comments, and I would tend to support what Marty said. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, science, uh, physics seminar is not the same as giving a popular talk in physics. Mm -hmm. It's not like writing a novel. It's not like writing a popular book. It's not like writing a play with you're telling a story. So let me give you a very specific example. Sure. Especially at a place like this, when there's so many talks, people have to choose and pick what mm -hmm. they go to. So if I organize a colloquium, if I don't set out an abstract, nobody's going to come. But mm -hmm. the abstract takes all the suspense away, because the abstract is a summary of the whole talk. <laughs> so, but if you don't set out an abstract, people don't know what it's about. You, you know, everybody's busy. Nobody's going to go to talk without an abstract. And, and that's just, just the bottom line. You know, whether or not, mm -hmm. and, and as Marty said, if, if the conclusion is not stated in the beginning, people start drip, you know, drifting out of the room. I mean, there, there's, you know, in a the theater, it's different because you bought, you, you know, the audience has bought a ticket. Right. You know, very different. <laughs> <laughs> Here, the talk is free. The talk, you don't charge any money for the talk. <laughs> that would be different. Um, I think that's really useful. I think what you guys can take from this, if it applies to your work, is that this is what keeps people paying attention. No, I think and what so, you're saying is really useful uh -huh. for, for a lot of things, like mm -hmm. writing, maybe writing a popular book, or writing an article, or something like this. But Well, uh, you've provided a perfect segue into my next question for you guys, which is you've all seen good talks, right? So I want everybody to take a minute, think of a good talk they've seen recently, and think of one thing that made it good. And it can be something we're talking about, or something completely different. So a good talk you've seen recently, and what, what something that made it good. Obviously, it would be a lot easier to think of a bad talk you've seen, but I'd much rather you actually stop and think, what's something good you've seen either recently or that's so good it stuck out over time, and what was one thing that made it good? Yeah? One of the things that, for me, makes a good talk good is astounding new results. Mm -hmm. When somebody's got something new, Mm -hmm. And I haven't seen it before, and it's really, uh, and it's really cool. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, then that's uh, that's a winner for me. <laughs> so that's like having a great climax, basically. What the whole thing is leading to, even if we tell it to you first and send you an abstract, that pulls you in. Yeah, Sarah. High stakes, something mm -hmm. that's going to make a huge difference, both in the scientific field or in whatever subject the talks about, that it, it grips the audience to the point where they understand the stakes that. It, change or for a new way of thinking or anything like that. The stakes and climax seem like they've been important. Other talks people have heard. Yeah. Well, I mean, I would say one of the important things is that a good speaker puts him or herself in the in the position of the audience and right. is aware of what the audience knows and doesn't mm -hmm. know. Right. Mm -hmm. And you present it in a lively fashion right. and you spend a lot of time making eye contact with all around the room. And all yeah. those right. things I think are really essential. and. And, and how to tell a story. And so there it doesn't even really matter what you're talking about. I, mean, I was right. thinking if you're teaching a class twice a week mm -hmm. for a whole term and the students can always choose not to come, 
because right. they have the book. And so the the objective there is to get the students to come and pay attention. Sure. And you have to tell a story every day. Mm -hmm. That's great. Those are all wonderful things. Yeah. I'm thinking of a, an adage, which I think many of us have heard many times, uh, that you should never underestimate the pleasure you give someone by telling them something they already know. <laughs> <laughs> and I think this goes with what Sandy said, that when you hear something that you already know, presented in a particularly engaging way, it may, in fact, deepen your understanding of that thing you supposedly already know, but it's uh -huh. actually also very pleasant to have somebody uh, but that's what novels and plays are about. That's what novels are about. Novels are about things you already know, but well, said in a different way. It's typically said about life. I would disagree. Yeah. But, but I also Seems disagree. like you guys have a lot to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> you said about the, you know, I don't give everything away in the abstract, for example, when I, when I give, give somebody an abstract. And I think there's a very different way that I present, say, a physics colloquium as a seminar. Mm -hmm. Because for a colloquium, I'm going to have a lot more background and I'm going to have a lot of stuff that people already know. And for a seminar, I'm directing it toward an audience that wants to hear the latest uh, stuff. Well, and that gets into know your audience, right? <laughs> and figure out how you're aiming your information. Any other thoughts on good talks? And I want to keep moving. Yeah. I always enjoy it when a talk gives more of the sort of the process that was involved in, mm -hmm. in each step. And like, oh, I thought that I could do this, and I tried this, and it didn't work. So then I tried this. Mm -hmm. this. So what interests you, it sounds like, is this part, right? Like how we get there. Mm -hmm. And what's useful about this for all of you to think about is that different people like different parts of talks. So there's not one, if you just focus on the climax, like you'll get Bill, but you might not get this guy. You, know, you kind of need to understand that all of these parts are part of a story, and we as people are going to be drawn to different parts just because of who we are. One or two more thoughts on good talks. Yeah. Um, I, I like when you know people um, talk about something that seems quite different from you know anything you actually knew, but it turns out that you know it's actually <laughs> quite surprisingly something you should have understood. There's this <laughs> idea in theater that the best plays are surprising and inevitable. Yeah. So that might be what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> That's very tricky to do, but it's good if you can do it. Uh, one more thought on a good talk. Anybody? Yeah. Uh, clarity, honesty, and perspective. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, really. I, mm -hmm. so, 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 some talks are really exaggerated, and, uh, and this is uh, not fun to listen to. And, uh, and and clarity, because if a talk is, is jumbled up, you know, you can't learn anything. Even if it's familiar, I can't learn anything from it. Mm -hmm. And and perspective, perspective in the sense that you know it, it, it fits into a broader picture of physics. You know, Great. And, and how how it fits in. So this person's not working in isolation. They understand the connections between things. That's one of the things that makes a great talk. Fabulous. Sarah, I also yeah. think enthusiasm slash passion. Mm -hmm. Whatever you're talking about, whether it's cooking or science or anything, you get someone's attention through your own passion for what you're doing. Well, that's a great segue into our next part, which is about, so now we're going to move on to storytelling strategies. And there are a million storytelling strategies, but three we're going to talk about today are the storyteller, mystery, and language. So I'm going to kick off with the storyteller, which goes back to what Sarah was saying. And what was your name again? Sandy. What Sandy was saying. So when you're standing up there telling us a story, whether or not you like it, you are the protagonist. I know that some scientists would rather feature their findings than themselves. But as the person telling the story, you're our way in. You represent your information. And the audience is much more likely to care about what you're saying if they care about you. So how do we make that happen? First of all, you don't need to like being up here for it to work. All you need is passion, what Sarah was talking about before. You need a clear objective, which goes back to clarity. You need high stakes. And you need a journey where something changes. Those are four really good ingredients for a talk that's going to hold on to an audience. So when you speak, let your enthusiasm for what you do come out. Again, if an audience senses you care about what you're saying, they're more likely to care. Also, relatedly, if an audience senses you care about them, they're more likely to care about what you say. Um, making people feel involved, making people feel like you care that they're there, whether it's doing what I'm doing and having you guys share, or if it's not set up that way, making eye contact, 
going slowly enough for people to hear you. There are all of these ways you can let an audience know that you care. Um, as Sarah said, your passion for what you do is key for keeping an audience alert. Even though what you're saying may be old news to you, if you can summon up some wonder and some discovery when you talk, your audience is more likely to stay with you. If you indicate that you're not interested, that you're a little tired of this thing, that's how they're going to feel about it. If you indicate that you'd rather run out the door than talk to them, they're going to feel that way too. Well, if he wants to run, I want to run, you know. But if you can indicate that you're inspired or excited or really glad that they came today to hear what you have to say, they're more likely to have those reactions too. An important thing to know is you can be yourself and still be an effective speaker. You don't have to be a performer or a clown. You don't have to have theater training. All you need to do is have a good story and show that you care about it. And if you do that, we'll root for you. Any questions about that or comments? Great. If you come up with one later, you can throw it in. We're now going to move on. Yeah. How about teasing the audience? Teasing the audience? <laughs> Is that something you like to do? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could do it better because it's not so easy. Absolutely. I agree with that. 100%. I think that's a very effective tool. <laughs> well, that's a great hook, which we'll talk about later, something to kind of pull them in. Um, if you want to come to the next talk, I don't know what it is yet, but we'll be talking about things like that, how to kind of play with your audience and relate to them more. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is this idea of mystery. So mystery, curiosity, wonder, these are the very words that got many of you into what you do now. Something caught your interest. Something sounded impossible, and you had to learn more about it. Mystery is a great way to keep an audience hooked. There's a rule that one of my playwriting teachers would tell us. She called it rule number 560, which was weird because no other rule had a number, <laughs> but that one did. And she said, never tell an audience something until you've made them want to know the answer. So this is the idea that you want to hook people with a mystery and then slowly deliver information. Obviously what we're talking about, but sometimes you, know, you guys will present your conclusions first. It doesn't totally work, but even there it's getting back to how you found that that is maybe the answer to the mystery. Um, so let's think about how this can work at a party, right? Someone walks up to you and says, what do you do? So there are different kind of answers you can give when somebody asks you this question. And if you answer simply and honestly, it doesn't always go well. If I go to a party of people not in my business and someone says, what do you do? I say, I'm a playwright. And they say, oh, have you written any movies I would have seen? <laughs> And of course not. I'm a playwright. I don't write movies. But they don't know that, <laughs> you know. And it sounds like, from talking to some of you guys, this can happen here, too. I'm a theoretical physicist. <laughs> People's eyes glaze over. They get scared you're going to talk about math. <laughs> and that ends the conversation pretty quickly. So what can we do about this? Well, one thing I think is that you want, you can, if you can find a mysterious and friendly way to frame what you do, that can open up a conversation rather than shutting one down. A really good exercise for this is to think, how would I explain what I do to a 10-year-old? So for me, you know, I tell you guys, I write plays that explore the mysteries of human relationships. I say that to a 10-year-old, they're out the door. They're not paying any attention. If I say, I write, you know, big scenes of people who don't get along, and obviously that's a gross simplification of what I do, but that conflict is interesting. So, well, oh, is there a fight? What happens? Does somebody die? You know, it, it, it gets their brains going. So I want everybody here to take a second and think, how would I explain what I do to a 10-year-old so that they don't walk out the door? And keep it simple. Don't be afraid to be like ridiculously simple. Yeah? I've used this before. I play with really expensive toys. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Anybody else have a good way to explain what they do to a 10-year-old? I sit around and think. I think some 10-year-olds will be into that, but most. <laughs> no, but it's good. It's simple. It's good. Anybody else? Yeah? Uh, I study what happens when the oceans fall apart. That's high stakes. Anybody else? <laughs> All right, so the trick here, and I want everybody to keep thinking if you haven't come up with one yet, is that you can use your 10-year-old sentence on anybody. Your 10-year-old sentence is great for any adult who's not a specialist in what you do. You know, if you say, I play with really expensive toys at a party, someone will want to know what you're talking about. It could be a lot of things. <laughs> um, but people do best if you stay simple, 
Remember that what you know so well is actually still really mysterious to the rest of us. And the way you deliver it to us will keep us interested or we'll check out. So having one really simple sentence is actually a way to hold somebody's attention at a party, at a talk, at a conference, you know, passing somebody in the hall. Simple is actually better. Now, how does mystery work in a talk? This is something I thought about a lot today, because I don't know physics talks as well as I know other talks. And obviously, even in this room, there's disagreement about that. Mm -hmm. But I believe it actually goes back to this diagram, whatever order you choose to put the pieces in. And I think it's about this part here, the arrow. I think it's about the rising action. I think it goes back to the idea that in a mystery, the biggest clue comes at the end, and then we get what we've been looking for. And so it goes back to the idea of never tell an audience something until you've made them want to know the answer. So even if you put your conclusions up first, and then the mystery is how you got there, saving the best tidbit for last will keep them paying attention. So those are some thoughts on mystery. I'd love to know if there are any questions or if anyone else has a way they tell a 10-year-old what they do. Yeah? I, I try to find a cable that doesn't heat when current passes. That's usually what I say to them. <laughs> and then there is a risk. People always ask, did you find the cable? <laughs> Yeah. How about this one? I design and make proposal for these expensive toys that are. <laughs> <laughs> you have to bring him with you, but I think that'll work. <laughs> yeah. I think if you ask questions, it's really interesting, especially for ten-year-olds. But if you if you don't state uh, directly what you do, but you say, I've always been fascinated by, or here's a question I've always wanted to answer. I looked at the stars, and some disappeared, and new ones came. And I suddenly realized I didn't know how they were born or died. Mm -hmm. um, that's a question. It means you're involved in a search, and it, it allows the other person to be included. I think that's important. And I think it's um, really important to include the person who's asking you the question when you answer it. And I think I have a problem in my field, and I'm sure you guys do too, that you talk to people at such different levels, right? Like you talk to people who know so much. You talk to people who are brand new in the middle. And I think really stopping to assess who you're talking to and what they're going to be able to understand and making it clear that you're making an effort to answer it for them. And not in a patronizing way, but just in a like, you've asked me this question and now I'm going to try to give you an answer. Any other thoughts on mystery or what you'd say to a 10-year-old? Yeah. I noticed that the theorist, and almost everybody here is a theorist, you see I'm the, the odd person out uh, uh, here because this is, after all, an institute for theoretical physics. Are, I, I think the theorists are struggling with how you would say what you do to a 10-year-old. I think one good answer for them, maybe for me too, is I try to figure out how the world works. Mm -hmm. Now, where do you go from there? <laughs> but that's not too simple. That's great. Even to not 10-year-olds, even to like somebody's mom at a cocktail party. You know, I mean, that's, that's something somebody can wrap their brain around. It may sound ridiculously vague and zoomed out to you guys, but it's actually an entry point for someone that's not familiar with what you do. Yeah. But if you're working on something that people have a vague idea about, yeah. like for example, I work on black holes. Mm -hmm. People have an idea of, well, I think they have an idea of what, what a black hole is. So if you say, I'm, I work on black holes, yeah, I think people that would... automatically are excited. So tell me about it. And yeah. I think that's great. I think if you have a phrase that people know and are excited about, it's wonderful yeah. to work it in. I've thought about saving the best bit for the for the end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, that's a little risky, I think. Sometimes <laughs> people get sleepy as <laughs> you, you approach too much the, the, the end of the hour that you're given for the talk. Sure. So uh, sometimes, actually, if you put the uh, the best bit after the first 15, 20 minutes, then the rest is elaborating over it. And people you know, actually ask a lot, a lot more questions. Mm -hmm. Well, what I think is important about what you're saying is knowing what the best bit is, right? Knowing what this is, whether you put it at the beginning, 15 minutes in, at the end, knowing what's going to have the biggest impact and intentionally putting it somewhere in your structure is an, an important part of storytelling. You know, we've all seen a movie where like a horrible thing happens, we have no idea what's going on, and the whole movie gets us back to that. And you're surprised that that's a surprising and inevitable thing. Then you see it again. You're like, oh, that's how she got killed, you know. But I think it's what you're saying. It's like in, in an hour structure, you found it useful to do that after 15, 20 minutes. Um, I'm going to keep going on to language, but we're going to have time for questions at the end if there's more. And anybody else along the way who thinks of their 10-year-old thing to say, I'd love to hear it. So, so here are some thoughts on language, ways to keep your audience engaged. So use words your audience knows. This goes back to knowing who you're talking to. Um, I would suggest staying away from acronyms <laughs> and overly complicated 
complicated <laughs> words. As somebody who's engaged to a scientist, I know that like, acronyms can get frustrating. Like MDQ. <laughs> but I, I defined it. I defined it. If you use an unusual word or an acronym, it's great just to say it and then simply define it and really normalize that the person you're talking to may have no idea what you're talking about. Um, Whenever possible, use images to describe what you're talking about. Images are much more powerful than words. I had a funny memory while I was writing this. I took like a physics for poets class in college, and there was the day we were talking about like the saddle-shaped universe and that idea, and we came in and there was a Pringle on everybody's desk, <laughs> and he was showing us what the shape was. And I'm not a very good spatial thinker, and that really worked for me. So I think any way you can boil something down to an image, or an everyday idea that people know, that's a really good entry point. You know, if you said to somebody, I study how the universe is a Pringle, you'd have their attention. <laughs> um, it's really important to vary your rhythm when you speak. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean pepper in some short sentences. <laughs> they help an audience stay alert. They help an audience catch up if you've been giving them a lot of long ideas. They help you kind of regain your breath and get back to where you are. This is also not what I'm talking about today. That's also really good when you're writing. <laughs> Have some short sentences along the way. Um, so that probably means you have to practice what you're going to say <laughs> to know where you'll put in some short sentences. But I think that practicing is a good too. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is the idea of a hook. So I said at the beginning, there's a small window at the start of any presentation conversation where you can hook somebody or not. And it's like there's this little window where an audience decides whether or not they're going to get on board. It happens in a movie. It happens in a talk like this. It even happens in a conversation. And if possible, you want to hook your audience in that window because it's really tricky to get an audience after that. It's possible, but it's hard. So hooks are like what we're talking about with this 10-year-old sentence thing. Other useful ways to, talk, to think about hooks are what's something that's funny, what's a mystery that might interest somebody, like Sarah was saying, like why do some stars disappear? Presenting a really arresting image, if you can describe what you do, like black holes or something that pull people in because they have this image of what a black hole is. So these are some ideas for hooks. Um, I'm sure there are more. These are the three that seem most powerful to me. But it's just great to kind of know what's my hook? How am I going to get these people to pay attention right away? My last two thoughts on language are about tone and energy level. These are really part of my next talk, which is about how you use your body and your voice when you speak. I thought it was important to bring them up today, just because I know the population here is always changing. But if these interest you, you should definitely come to the next talk, too. So tone. When I say tone, what do I mean? I mean where your voice sits when you talk. I mean actually the way you affect what you're saying. How you sound actually affects your audience more than what you say. So you could be saying like the most revelatory thing in the world. But if you mutter, if you sound uninterested, if you seem nervous, that's what your audience is going to associate with what you're saying. So it doesn't matter how amazing it is if what you're conveying with how you're saying it is like, I don't really want to be here, and maybe you shouldn't be here either. <laughs> um, and that connects directly to energy level. So if you appear energetic, enthusiastic, really glad people are here, and I'm not saying don't be yourself. I'm not saying you know become some crazy cheerleader you're not. But in whatever way you're comfortable, for some people it's just seeming calm and present. Whatever it is that makes the audience know, hey, this person wants to be here and talk to me, that means, oh, maybe I want to be here and listen to them. Um, I think that's a really good way to hook an audience in and see and let them see that you want to be there. So those are kind of the big ideas we're going to be hitting on today. To recap a lot of what we've talked about today, you have a contract with your audience to take care of them. You want to tell them a story with strong objective and a clear, strong climax. Whether or not you want to be, you are the storyteller. So we're going to root for you and stay focused if you have a good story that matters to us. Remember, your audience has never heard your story before, so let wonder and discovery come through in what you say. You can use mystery and language to keep your audience engaged. You can use your 10-year-old sentence to talk to anybody. <laughs> And I know it sounds cheesy, but if you can figure out a way to have fun and in some way smile when you're up here, that actually helps the audience hear what you're saying, too. We'll talk more about that at my next talk. Anyway, thank you for being here today, and I'm glad to take some questions. Yeah. Yeah, so why do you think this is so universal across music and books, stories, uh, scientific papers and talks? 
Mm-hmm. What do you think of sort of the, the deep truth here of narrative structure? That's a really good question. I, I wonder, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, it is interesting that myths from different cultures that could not have possibly been connected use this structure, and so many different disciplines use it. I more trust it than know the answer, but um, I'd love to know more about that. Other thoughts or questions? Yeah. Uh, part, a lot of my work here deals with donors who know very little about science when they start out, and so their first contact is with scientists who need to tell a story about what goes on here or with their work. And I think one of the hardest points for a theoretical physicist is the stakes, because mm-hmm. this is theory, and it's not going not to, climate to produce the next widget mm-hmm. you know, in the next year that's going to be something you can sell. So I'd love to know from science <coughs> How would they can tell their stories in a way that makes theory uh, more engaging? Mistakes and stories that are being told to who, I guess? Donors, people who are just finding out about the, the kinds of big questions that are investigated here. Well, I choose to switch to neuroscience. <laughs> <laughs> but, right. Most of our traditional ways is to talk about historical events. <laughs> Evolution of uh, theoretical ideas that have ultimately produced something that's revolutionized well, one of the, uh, lives and experience. One of the, the stories that I, there's two stories that I like to tell in this regard, the, the, the historical thing. One is uh, Einstein's theory of general relativity, one of the most arcane things that, that ordinary people uh, would, would ever encounter. Uh, is absolutely essential if you want to make the GPS system work. If, mm-hmm. if you didn't know Einstein's theory of general relativity, the GPS system would, wouldn't work at all. Uh, you would have discovered it <laughs> the first time you tried to make a GPS life. system. And uh, uh, I usually spice that up by telling the story that at the time that Einstein came up with that theory, that it was reported, probably incorrectly, that only three people in the world understood uh, his, his theory, and I you know, tell a humorous story about Sir Arthur Eddington, but anyway. Um, but, uh, but, I, but, but, you know, so, so mixing those things up is exactly what, what Daniel was, was saying. The other thing I say is quantum mechanics. When people came up with quantum mechanics, uh, I'm sure that the general public thought, well, this is something that's not of any interest to us at all. It just tells us how things work at the atomic level, and I don't really care because I can't see atoms at all. I care about it. And now, none of the stuff that we consider part of our daily lives that are essential to what we consider to be modern life would have been possible mm-hmm. uh, without understanding quantum mechanics, at, and was only understood as a as a theoretical way of understanding some really minor uh, difficulties in. Uh, <laughs> well, that's such a great example because it's about something everybody has their cell phone in their pocket, right? Yeah. One question that I get all the time is, what is the practical application of what you're working on? And and I usually start, I, I mean, as an explanation, I say it's not obvious now, but then I, as a parable, I talk about the invention of the transistor, mm-hmm. which yeah. took 30 years before really the invention of the integrated circuit made it practical. And then a colleague of mine was one of the inventors of the laser, and he had no idea what the laser was good for. I tell the story that he said, Look, Every typist will have a laser to use as an eraser. <laughs> and I say, we now use laser printers. Lasers are ubiquitous. <laughs> but, but if this is what the inventor could think of, um, it's just fascinating. And so you again expect that almost any technology is going to take 20 or 30 years at, at best before it becomes practical. That's great. But at the same time, a lot of people don't accept that, mm-hmm. that answer. The answer being that, well, it's all it's happened so many times in the past, trust us now. <laughs> the the other way of saying what you're what what the importance is of what you're doing, again, I like to tell stories when I uh, when I, I get these questions. Ben Franklin attended the launch of a balloon in Paris, one of the first balloons, and it was at the time of the Montgolfiers and all that. And the um, the incident is commemorated in a uh, a bronze relief in uh, Père Lachaise Cemetery in Paris. And it shows Franklin, a short guy, standing mm-hmm. on a box so he could see better. And the story that goes with it is that afterwards, somebody said, <clears throat> what good is all of this? And 
Franklin replied, something that we've all heard, but he may have been the first one to use it in a scientific context, of what use is a newborn baby? Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I don't know if he was the first one to, but, but we've all heard that. And that is, in a sense, one of the answers to give to what good is what we do. But a lot of people aren't, aren't very accepting of that kind of an answer. And the result of that is that we are often driven to speculate wildly and uh, almost always incorrectly about what our stuff will be good for. So when Art thought that it would be used as an eraser, of course it was wrong, but it was right too, because it was the other side. He never meant it. <laughs> It's so funny because nobody has typewriters anymore. Right. Nobody has typists anymore. Right. But it's used as an eraser for graffiti. You know, so he was right. You know? <laughs> but but this happens all the time, and, pe and, and we end up being pushed to make the most fantastic claims right. about what good we're going to uh, is going to come of what we do, and it, that usually goes badly. <laughs> oh, I, I disagree a little bit. You felt I the audience you're talking to because a, a non-specialist. Uh, loves that one moment. I understand you're speculating, but it allows their imagination to go forward with you. And they, if you say it could lead to yeah. these kinds of things, mm -hmm. if you, you've allowed them to to go into the future and say, uh, I can see why this is important. They're not going to hold you to your contract. Well, that's the thing. As long as they don't. Of course, I usually <laughs> find this appearing in the newspaper after I've talked to a journalist. <laughs> Oh, no, I didn't yeah. say that, did I? <laughs> May I say, say something? I, I actually disagree with some of the things said, because that implies that theoretical physics should be of use. Mm -hmm. And my favorite story in this regard is actually Bob Wilson. He was testifying in front of Congress about the United States building accelerators. Mm -hmm. And some senator asked him, how, does, how do accelerators contribute to the national defense? So accelerators are the things that make this nation worth defending. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how and we should look at theoretical physics. Well, I wish that we're that not, You are an experimental physicist, yeah. so I only speak I, for myself. I, I, I'm sure. sure. <laughs> and I understand the distinction, but of course an accelerator <laughs> does experimental physics. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, so, you know, and, uh, and, and I was actually in favor of building the SSC, which they spent, you know, n billion dollars on, and then quit. You know, I thought that was a, a really sad thing to do. But the problem is that while I wish that that were a good enough answer, basically because it contributes to the intellectual life of a society, and that should be a good enough answer. But people could say that about history and uh, anthropology and writing plays. And if that's the only thing we can give them, then we'll get the same funding. <laughs> <laughs> and so we better have another story. <laughs> it's interesting to hear how much theoretical, talking about theoretical physics is kind of like talking about playwriting. Um, any other questions, thoughts? Yeah. I, mean, I thought I have about this, this uh, diagram of yours is that um, when one can talk normally, you know, you have a certain amount of freedom about the inciting incident and so on, but afterwards you sort of, you know, I did I did X and I did Y and I did Z and, and then, you know, this is the this result I came up with. I mean, it's very constrained. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't really see, you know, given that you have to say X before Y before Z, I don't, I don't really understand how you, well, you know, how you get to sort of say the best views for the S or to emphasize the bits you uh, mm -hmm. You really think it's like why it might be the most exciting part and not Z? Or yeah, exactly. Because and, and you know Z wouldn't make sense before Y, so you couldn't. You, you sure. Couldn't and I that. said that before. Like this, this linear thing isn't. You know, this idea of like a linear narrative may not work for much yes, of what you guys are doing. I guess the question is, what alternative do you? You know, how do you how do you get to keep the nice things about linear narrative? Right. Without? It has to do with build. It has to do with keeping people focused. I mean, what the gentleman in the back said before that he finds it's useful to put the good bits in. What do you say, like 15 or 20 minutes in? Mm -hmm. That isn't this picture at all, but that's still using this shape. So the knowledge that people want what you're saying to build in some way, I don't know if that's having a funny anecdote in the middle that you know keeps them going, or a really cool slide, or you know whatever it is, I wouldn't underestimate kind of shiny things to keep people's attention. <laughs> yeah. One of the, the points I think that is important about 
this kind of, say, structure and advice is that it may work very differently in the cocktail party conversation mm -hmm. than it would work in a seminar. Mm -hmm. In a seminar, pretty much people want to hear what's the deal. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And they're not interested in a whole lot of embellishment. Mm -hmm. In my public lecture, you know, which is a whole different thing from, from either a colloquium or uh, mm -hmm. a seminar, I learned over a period of time to put one of the most dramatic demonstrations at the end because it just worked better to have that shiny thing yes. at the end. I used to put it in the middle where it made more sense logically and chronologically. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that doesn't matter. <laughs> what matters is having the levitation happen at the end. <laughs> well, so here's the question I have for you. So if a seminar is more about like blurt, like here's what it is. I imagine there are good seminars and there are bad seminars. Yeah. So what characterizes a good one and what characterizes a bad one in terms of holding? The good one is one I can understand. So maybe, so maybe when the shape doesn't work, then it's more thinking about the stuff today about how do you hold on to your audience in terms of knowing who they are, in terms of clarity. You know, not everything will fit everything. If I did this in a seminar, I would. Yeah. No, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Well, I think there's there's a funny thing that happens in seminars um, and even shorter talks, and it's a, a problem that we kind of face as scientists, is that when we go and present our work, and I, I mean, I think everyone's seen a talk like this, where somebody gives a talk on their work, and they talk through it in, in the order in which they did things, in the order of like, so they did this, and this led to this, and this led to this, and this led to this. But that linear narrative in terms of the process doesn't actually match with a linear narrative in terms of getting from a question to an answer. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it takes you in all sorts of different directions um, and kind of looping back and forth. And then you lose your audience. It's not nearly as interesting as if you t sit down and think about what did I do to get from my question to my answer rather than what did I do to just go through the different steps of my research. And I find a lot of scientists early um, will do <coughs> one than the other. And it takes a trick to actually stop and not think about how did I do this, but actually how is this going <coughs> yeah. frame it and tell it. You're absolutely right. And in a, for example, in a colloquium, I try to make it so that it's pedagogical rather than historical. Mm -hmm. And one of the results is I lie a lot. <laughs> yeah, no, you do not to. But in the seminar, I tend not to because I haven't actually haven't figured out myself so well yet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe that's the problem. Yeah, well, no, that's the trick. Even in, in in a good seminar, if you can keep it focused so that the sort of linear narrative focuses on the idea rather than on you, your approach to the idea. It's actually, yeah, that's the difference. The idea versus your approach to the idea. Yeah. If like you can the do that evolution even, of the idea. Yeah, if you can do that even within the context yeah. of a seminar, you're going to have a, a narrative with much better build. One of the things that I think a lot of us have an opportunity to do is to fine tune what is almost the same talk based on the reaction of each audience. Mm -hmm. When you get questions that reveal that you didn't do such a good job of uh, exposing your ideas, then you want to use that as a way of changing the way you present it the next time. <laughs> well, honestly, that's how theater works too. That's why there are previews for shows, or that's what you know. I, I mean, anything that you get to do more than once will hopefully get better <laughs> as a result of having done it before. Um, I can sense we're kind of starting to lose people, so I wanted to like people that want to stay totally should. But thank you all so much for coming, and I hope you come to the next talk. <laughs>